This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. In two weeks, we will have our first meeting of Renegade University in the nation's capital. That's right. March 15th, 16th, and 17th, Renegade University comes to Washington, D.C., featuring me and our special guest, Camille Foster of Unregistered Fame. Also, of course, of the Fifth Column podcast and the lead producer at Freethink Media. We still have a couple of VIP tickets left and a few for the general weekend. For more information and to buy tickets for the Renegade University weekend in Washington, D.C. with me and Camille Foster, go to ThaddeusRussell.com slash courses. Politics is about power, control, punishment, prisons, armies, war, and death. People who do politics, in my experience, tend to be quite miserable because of this. But politics can also be about making people happy. Politics can even be about making oneself happy. This is my interview with John Gabriel. I have run across this very strange creature. I don't think I've ever found one in captivity or in the wild. It's a person who has devoted their lives to politics, but seems to be happy. <laughs> you. John yeah. Gabriel, <laughs> I, I, I've been following you on Twitter for quite a while now, and you just stuck out for that very reason. You're in politics. You do political journalism. You do basically what I do and all my friends do. And we're all miserable and we hate it. And we all are aware of this, by the way. I don't know if you know about this, but like oh, yeah. political journalists are very clear. Generally speaking, we say, you know, we wish we weren't this way. We wish we didn't think about this stuff all the time because it just makes us unhappy because it's about coercion and power and death and prisons and war and all the bad stuff. But I see this guy on my Twitter feed who's totally of that world, who is just enjoying life. And the thing that really I told you, sorry, I kind of had a crush on you in a way, was when you were on, you were just taking a trip of the West Coast and you were taking pictures and talking about how beautiful it was. And then you would, every once in a while, there would be a picture of your face and you'd just be smiling by yourself on some beach somewhere. And I thought, this is a guy I could talk politics with and hang out with. And there's something about, there's some sensibility inside of you that I just think is unusual in our world that I really admire and, and want to emulate. And so that's why I invited you onto the show and I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's yeah. great to be on. So you are, tell us your title and what you're doing now, and then we can get back into the, the deeper history and talk about some issues. Yeah, but, I'm editor in chief at ricochet.com and it's a uh, website, I'd say center right, anything from center right to libertarian. Um, I'm kind of in that squishy conservatarian mold. Um, I do a podcast called The Conservatarians with uh, Stephen Miller, Red Steez on mm -hmm. Twitter, and uh, very, write for the local paper. A very public. bad man, Stephen yeah. Miller. Yes, I've seen him on Twitter. He's <laughs> very bad. Don't ever read anything he says. Yeah. So you write, oh, you write, you write for the Arizona? Yeah, Arizona Republic. Yeah, yeah I'm a column, like every couple of weeks, right. I write for them, weekend editions, just in Sunday's paper. So talk about, I don't know, I'm the only guy I think there that talks national stuff, but I pop between national and state-based stuff. So. Okay. Goldwater Institute? Yep. Before before I started writing, I was at the Goldwater Institute for a couple of years, state-based think tank out of Phoenix. Um, 
more libertarian. I, I would th- I would think they're kind of conservatarians based on the people there, but uh, you, just limited government, pushing limited government. There. Oh, I thought I thought you advocated nuclear annihilation of Southeast Asia. That's what Goldwater. Look, is. look, I'm not going to go back to all my past articles. You know, I was a different <laughs> man then. I wasn't happy like I am now. <laughs> I just I thought that was Goldwater's thing, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just Curtis LeMay's thing. Uh, so, well, yeah, tell us about the Goldwater Institute. I know a little bit about you guys, and I know uh-huh. you're sort of libertarian and sort of not, and mm-hmm. do, but interesting stuff, though. Yeah, yeah, really uh, just a state-based think tank uh, working to reduce the impact of government in people's lives. So um, I left there maybe four years ago, but really that was my first job in politics or policy. Before that, I was always a uh, private sector. So working there for a couple of years was like policy boot camp for me. Hmm. Uh, really pushing school choice is okay. a huge huge thing. Um, always pushing that. Um, lower taxes, lower government spending, lower regulations, all that. Clint Bullock was there, who was with Institute for Justice. Now he's on the Arizona Supreme Court, actually, uh, which is pretty great. But he did just a lot of litigation, you know, for mm. African hair braiders. For mm. uh, His first case was a shoeshine guy um, oh, in no uh, Washington, D.C., uh, that the city was trying to shut down because he didn't have, I don't know, a master's degree in shoe design or something like that and they tried to shut him down that was his first case ego brown i think the guy's no name was kidding yeah so that was his very first case he did it uh, pro bono you know what i've been wanting to do a project for a long time which is the title the working title is the black market mm-hmm. which or maybe just black market because i want to i want to do i want to focus on and celebrate really people in what are called the ghettos doing what you're just talking about yeah, you know these yeah. these nail salons these hair salons that mm-hmm. are illegal and underground operated right. by black women uh-huh. or the shade tree mechanics operated by black men and people come and they don't pay taxes and they don't pay anything you know it's just mm-hmm. that they get great service and yeah the ghettos have been operating with a big black market forever really yeah. and yeah. it's sort of it's not really known and it's not really right. co- unless you live there. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been wanting to really focus on that and do some journalism on them. And I know it's hard to talk to people who are doing things that are illegal, but <laughs> I love this and people don't understand this. It's like, they think that, you know, free market types are for some reason don't like black people, but in fact, right, yeah. you guys, and you're a bunch of white dudes, as uh-huh. white as hell, <laughs> all you con- conservative libertarian, some of you are Reagan people. I mean, you should be the devil. You, your first thing was to help the the shoe shine guy, right? And, right. The, and the, exactly what I'm talking about, exactly. these people in the ghetto, because it's right they are under the boot of the state with mm-hmm. the licensing, right. right? And that goes for the barrio too. I live in the yeah. Phoenix area, and you have all these people, recent immigrants, people who have one of my roommates when I was in college. You know, his family had lived in Arizona when it was still part of Mexico, and uh, you would hang out at his house, go down to the barrio, and it was yeah. Everybody was doing work, but it wasn't mm-hmm. all in the books. And like you said, it's always operated this way. So yeah. why don't we just uh, bring it out into the sunlight and uh, let these people help their communities? Let, do, let, them, do, let them do more of it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's this tiny town uh, between Phoenix and Tempe where ASU is, Arizona State, and uh, called Guadalupe. That's where Joe Arpaio, when mm-hmm. he was our hideous sheriff, mm-hmm. uh, would do a lot of his raids. That's another community that had been there longer than any of us crackers. Mm-hmm. And they were... <laughs> They were doing great the whole time, and he came in and thinking they were illegal immigrants, but they had been there. A lot of them were uh, ethnic Yaquis, an Indian tribe that was being uh, wiped out by the Mexican government at the turn of the century, turn of the last century. And uh, and yeah, that uh, cool little community doing their own thing. Let them do their own thing. Hmm. It's like I was going to say, you sounded like a commie until that end, <laughs> the, the last part, right? It's the do that, let them do their own thing. That's not commie. <laughs> no, but until no. then, you sound just like a commie. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, so here's the big question. Like, have you guys ever tried to reach out and, and work as a, in a coalition with the left or liberal groups in any, on any um, of these I issues? I know when I was at uh, Goldwater, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of school choice is big. And I know you see that like in D.C. Hmm. Uh, with scholarships, but uh, getting out on Arizona has actually been at the forefront of school choice. Started with charter schools in the early 90s. Um, but now they have something called uh, education savings accounts, which basically instead of all the money the state government was going to spend on educating a student, the parents can dip into that money for you got a kid who's autistic or you got a kid who's being bullied at school and you want to do online learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got uh, the Navajo Nation is vast and very sparse and you have a lot of kids who can't get every day to a school, you know, driving 30 miles for a bus that doesn't exist and uh, doing distance learning with those. Everyone's everyone's needs are different. Everybody learns in a different style and just accommodating it to the kid rather than the government bureaucrat. You think that's preferable to putting all the children into one box? Believe it or not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
It, like I, I have two daughters, both in high school now. They go to different schools. They've switched schools continually because they have totally different styles, wow. and they're both love the schools they're at. So, but they're 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 nomadic or migratory, right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And when one school starts sucking, we move them. Isn't that interesting? And they they asked to move, and we're like, great, sounds good. Complete tangent, John. But uh-huh. I'd like to see uh, hear what you have to say about this. I just. Uh, found out about a man who's a Vietnam veteran, a Mexican-American who was raised in poverty in Kansas, who's now 75 years old and dying of cancer. And he is happier than he's he's shot up in Vietnam, Purple Heart. He is happier now than he's ever been. And for several years, this is the golden years of his life, even though he's dying of cancer. Why? He lives and has lived for years in Marriott hotels. He gains so much, and he lives entirely on his VA pension, uh-huh. but because I guess he gets so many points or something from, uh-huh. living, from staying in Marriott's, and he can do it fairly cheaply, and like all the maids know him, and he just loves it. He says, this is the greatest. He says, every day I wake up, and I thank God for my life, <laughs> even though he is a Vietnam veteran, unemployed, Mexican dude, single, who's dying of cancer, uh-huh. and he goes from hotel to hotel to hotel. And it was like, at first, my first thought was, oh, this poor man. That's mm-hmm. such a sad existence. Right. And then my second thought was, wait a second, my mother just told me that, no, in fact, he's thrilled and he loves this. Uh-huh. They're, they're friends with my parents. He's friends with my parents. And uh, I was like, why the hell did I immediately assume that he's a victim of right. circumstance or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I know why. <laughs> but also I thought, I wonder if this is sort of going on. It is sort of generally going on. I think people mm-hmm. are more migratory in all sorts right. of ways. Right, right. And so that you're... And school choice is an obvious example of yeah. this, and but that your kids are very comfortable mm-hmm. with moving between places, right? Right, crossing right. those boundaries. Where my my son, on the other hand, is like very nervous about uh-huh. you know moving even out of his bedroom sometimes, right? Right, right? Um, and so it's hard to get him to do stuff. But I, I think there's a new attitude. I mean, one of my my partner, my business partner, lives in an RV, mm-hmm. and he's part of a. It's I think they're called the nomadic community. There's uh-huh. an RV community, and they just they know each other, and they just travel around the North oh, America. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And I th- see more of this. You know, right. the, the internet, the of course the boundaries, the national boundaries, kind of softening, and people mm-hmm. crossing in various ways. But is that something that you sort of see going on generally? Like, yeah, and I think, you know, look at people, the gig economy is yeah. huge, you know, just people jumping from place to place. And I think it's actually good training for my kids. You know, it wasn't intentional, but they've gone to public schools, they've gone to charter schools, they've done online stuff, they've gone to, you know, extra tutoring and this subject or that to uh, different centers. They're used to it. And if none of those work, they're online. They're on Khan Academy. Mm-hmm. They're somewhere else trying to learn about stuff. Uh, my youngest daughter, and she's a lot like me, just didn't didn't want to pay attention to school, kind of, well, I, I think I was diagnosed as a spaz when I was a kid. Now it's ADD, ADHD. <laughs> that, they're just that's like, what the doctors the told, hell down. Yeah. The, doc, the doctors told your parents, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gabriel, your son is a, uh, technically a spaz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I just, you know, as a kid, I couldn't pay attention or anything. It's like my youngest daughter, she'll, in the middle of the summer, no school, she'll say, hey, I made a PowerPoint on the Great Depression. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, it was interesting. So I just researched it online. And I'm like, okay, that's how you learn, kid. Good wow. for you. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I'm seeing that more and more. But this sort of physical migratory thing, I think, is really exciting. It's uh-huh. it, it's scary for me because that was my first reaction to this guy who was you know in these hotels. But I think it's the better way to live for me, not, right? Not right. for everyone. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'm gonna go there too. I don't know if I'm gonna mm-hmm. live in Marriotts <laughs> or RVs, but right. I, I do like the idea. I'm very restless. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why my politics are what they are. Mm-hmm. I I mean, I'm physically restless. I right. don't like being in the same place for a long time. I've mm-hmm. never lived. I think the longest I've ever lived in one place was seven years in uh-huh. my life. You know, so yeah, I think it's exciting and scary, and but it's I think it's going to be better. Oh, I think it will be, yeah. and and just understanding that there's not a one size fits all. Uh, yeah, we'll have one it. guy. My cousin lives in a small town in Michigan. Loves it. Been there his whole life. Hmm. Loves it. Kicking ass. Hmm. Runs his own business. Having a great time. And you have another person who every year moves. Awesome. Hmm. Let it fly. Do it. Do what makes you happy and not understanding there's one solution. Like you need to stay in your community and help build it up or you need to travel all the time. It's just get out of people's way and let them live their life. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, you know, th- that way you can find happiness. And that's my thing, too, with traveling. You know, I don't do enough of it, especially, too, with like kids. You can't do as much. But um, 
I don't know, who I am, I would like to bring that to different places rather than just feel like I need to sit down and this is my lot and I'm going to work for the factory until I get my pension. So. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I think that's why we are what we are. Yeah. So uh, school choice, what's, what do you guys, what's your position on school choice? Are you just for more charter schools? Are you for abolishing the public education system like I am? What, what is it? <laughs> I am for constantly pushing the boundaries on uh, public education. I think... It's understandable. Mm. It, it, you can't replace public education overnight or anything like that. Mm. And I don't know if you'd want to, if some people are happy with it, but you need to make sure. I, I think my principle is, um, do the kids belong to either, depending on their age themselves or their parents, or do they belong to the government? And yeah. the teachers union think they belong to the government. Mm -hmm. So As does the and, government. Exactly. Exactly. And the government is fine with that arrangement. So the more you can get them out of the equation, the better. And especially, too, with uh, technology and online learning, I can see kids just sitting at home learning. I have a good friend of mine, no libertarian, you know, kind of a doctrinaire Republican, I'd say. His kid who was all, he graduated K through 12, just doing online courses from about eighth grade on. Hmm. And he loved it. Hmm. And it was great for him. Hmm. Um, you know, when I was a kid, there's no way in hell I could have done it. I just would have been screwing around. But um, just letting people do what works for them, I think is the best and understanding that kids are not wards of the state. Um, and they can frankly get a hell of a lot better education if, uh, they have a style of learning that's adapted to them, uh, whatever the hell it is. So yeah. a lot of it, it's like all the stuff that I learned, uh, you know, college courses is I would do the required reading and that would spark other questions for me. And then I would just do all this reading and research on my own. It's like, that's the stuff that I learned, not right. whatever the teacher was shoving down my ear holes. Right. So Goldwater Institute is a think tank and I assume does also basically lobbying. Yeah. Yeah. Which means you're doing actually talking to government officials, right? Right. Right. Which yeah. means you have to wear business suits. Am I correct? Uh, yeah. Pretty loose in Arizona, though. They aren't big on ties in Arizona. Oh, really? I actually got when I worked in the private sector, I got chewed out at two different jobs by two different CEOs for uh, showing up with a tie the first day. They're like, what in the hell are you doing, Gabriel? But you, but you still got to dress up. Yeah. Right? And you got to yeah. and you're all a bunch of old white guys, right? Yeah. You know, hetero, yeah. all that. <laughs> You know, and one of you used to work for Reagan, right? Um, yeah, well, that was actually, yeah, I'm trying to think. There was a few people um, working for the government there, but now working at ricochet.com. Mm -hmm. Now that I write for them, yeah, it was founded by Rob Long, who is a head writer at oh, Cheers. Right. Yeah, yep. head writer at Cheers. And Peter Robinson, who was a speechwriter for Reagan, he wrote Tear Down This Wall. He wrote that speech. Tear Down This Wall. Mr. Gorbachev, is that what he said? Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Yeah. Gorbachev. Tear Down This Wall. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. So your friend. It you... was Tear Down This Wall, you son of a bitch, but he got changed. So. <laughs> So he's he's one of the people at Ricochet, which is your other right, thing. Right, right. That's uh -huh. not part of Goldwater. Not at all. Separate. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm no longer – yeah, I was at Goldwater for two years. I'm not there anymore. But I that see. was really like, you know, like I say, policy boot camp for me. Gotcha. Understanding the various positions. Okay, so Ricochet is your thing right now. Yeah. And those are the three of you. So uh -huh. you got the Cheers writer, you got the Reagan writer, and you got John. <laughs> right. But you're all that guy, right? You're all the middle-aged uh, white journalist, whatever. You we know. also have Bethany Mandel, who uh, just started. Uh, she's a – started, what, six months ago, nine months ago? Um, she lives in D.C., uh, mm -hmm. works as an editor for us. So – and. The, the thing that makes Ricochet interesting is the members. Um, if you pay a very small fee, uh, you can write your own posts, and those are always the best posts. It's people who, guy runs a concrete company in Kentucky, someone else is a retired military dude in Florida, someone else is a you know associate professor in uh, rural Kansas. That's where you get the interesting posts, because people have different perspectives, they don't live this stuff, what's important to... Whoever sets the news cycle, they could give a shit about. <laughs> you know, basically, they they are out there just living their life and observing life, and you could get way more interesting perspectives. Yeah, I'm right now as you're speaking. I'm toying in my mind with a model of social change, uh, an analytical model of social change, how it happens, right? So I'm thinking of Martin Luther King of all things. You guys are respectable, basically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. You go, you go, have to go. You have to go to the state capitol. You have right. to speak the proper English and dress properly and look right, right. particular ways. That's what I mean, right? You can't say particular well, I've things. I stopped drooling too. You which don't. Is a plus. I notice you don't curse much. Yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, and on Twitter, you're very clean. All uh -huh. of you guys, right? So, okay, so Martin Luther King was that, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, he would go try to negotiate with city governments like in Birmingham, Alabama right. to desegregate. And they were like, uh, why? We're going to put you in jail instead because <laughs> right. you're a black guy in a suit. So yeah. what? We like that you're Christian and don't curse and uh -huh. all that. But 
Now, the thing was, in Birmingham also had all these other black people in it who were nothing mm-hmm. like Martin Luther King, right. you know? And they, instead of wanting to talk to the police, threw bricks at the police during mm-hmm. those marches. And the actual, the hoses and the dogs in those famous scenes were actually not against King's people. Those were against these other black people who were coming right. to do some violence. Yeah. Some radical people who mm-hmm. wanted to just destroy the police mm-hmm. force instead of negotiate with it or right. ne- and negotiate with the city fathers to deseg- desegregate downtown Birmingham. So, uh, so you guys are Martin Luther King, and I'm those bad black people <laughs> with the bricks and the rocks. And okay, so here's what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, in 1963. And I swear to God, this will be relevant, John. <laughs> Martin Luther King, in the letter from Birmingham jail, very famous, you know, the most famous thing he wrote, says this. Everyone should go read it. To the city father, to the the chamber of commerce, the mayor, the heads of the department stores, all segregated downtown Birmingham. I said, look, you can either deal with me and my business suit Mm -hmm. and my King's English and my Christianity, or you can deal with those bad (laughs) N-words out there in the street, right? Uh And they said, oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> signed desegregation right. boom so mm-hmm. the argument has been made that both are needed mm-hmm. to really get things done right i think that's probably right yeah um i would prefer just to fight but that's okay i want uh-huh. I'm, i would rather also not die so yeah. so i want people like you kind of up there i don't want to ever go to the capitol either but I want people like you up there, but I also want to give you guys leverage. See, right. that's the point. You have to have a radical, you have to have a radical outer edge that gives people like you or Martin Luther King the leverage to say, look, sign this bill that gets us 50% toward, you know, free choice or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're going to have to deal with all these crazy people who are going to want to tear down the whole, your buildings, you know, and burn, burn your schools down. I mean, that there's a radical anger out there and yet you need, need to deal with us instead of them. Right. And I think that was a dichotomy, you know, it was a little before my time. I was born slightly after it, but the dichotomy between, um, Malcolm X and MLK, Precisely. you know, for, yeah. and this is just not government people, but just my mom watching the TV at home is like, Ooh, that black man's scary. Oh, that black man's nice. Look how well he speaks. Mm-hmm. And it, it just, I, I think you needed both of them because yeah. people knew change was coming. Yeah. Is what, what kind of change do you want? Yeah, Malcolm- because change was coming. I don't know how anybody could look at the situation in the 60s and go, Oh yeah, we'll continue to have Jim Crow and segregation. There's no way they could have thought that they yeah. knew it was going to change. Which which change do you take? So you're sympathetic to the idea that a, a, a more radical edge helps you do your job, actually. Right, right. Cool. I think so, and I think awesome. it's I think it's natural too. If I didn't if I didn't agree with the radical edge, it would happen. Yeah. So <laughs> what's, I, what's the point worried about it? So, it's just like people want change, and uh, you can either do it in a somewhat controlled fashion, or it can be chaos. Yeah. So my son is finishing his 13 year term. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be out in June. They're releasing him. Uh huh. Yeah, finally, after 13 years, he's leaving high school, <laughs> public school, 13 years. <laughs> Back into the general population. And I did 13 years in California public schools, too. So you might imagine what my attitude toward those places right. is, okay? So basically, I want to burn every single one of them down today. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, and I'm letting people know that very publicly, you know, as much as I can. That's, I say that on almost every podcast, okay? Uh-huh. So now I finally have someone in front of me who can actually use that energy for some <laughs> use, right? Something that's useful and actually not burn the schools down, but maybe shut some of them down or, right. or help at least some of those kids get free. Well, and the, the thing is, too, something that I've uh, pushed as well is a uh, good example. And I guess that's why I'm not like radically anti-public school is my kids started out in an elementary school that was a public school. But what's interesting, since we had school choice in Arizona, um, there were um, there was a public school district, Mesa Public School District, who opened two elementary schools with pure Montessori learning hmm. as a test. Hmm. Fantastic! Yeah. My both my kids went there. You could go to the official Montessori school, which was you know, I don't know two thousand a year or something like that, or just a normal public school that happened to use Montessori techniques. Both were wildly successful. They're still going. They have other ones that focus on science, other schools that focus on arts. That was a school district that looked at competition and said, "Oh, cool, we can work with that." And they've also opened up like almost social centers, clubs for homeschooled kids. So once a week, they can kind of hang out, meet other kids. They're not feeling as isolated. And that's the way teachers unions and public schools should address school choices. Like this is a great opportunity to improve our product. Instead, you have many people saying, no, we need to shut down all these other options. It's like, no, we need to expand these options. Hmm. And if you you guys can be part of it, or you guys can be, you know, in the dustbin of history. Oh, I see. You guys are actually in the business of making people's lives better. <laughs> 
it's terrible. Rather than just screaming about burning down buildings like me. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of right. the p- political people. This is another yeah. thing I like about your vibe, right? Uh-huh. It's like, not your vibe, your whole project. It's, it's that most political people, not just conservatives or libertarians, most political people, in fact, the left is even worse about this, first of all, are miserable, mm-hmm. right? Unlike you. <laughs> and second of all, they spend, of course, most of their time criticizing and complaining often with very sophisticated, brilliant analyses, mm-hmm. I might add, for yeah. sure. But it's, especially on the left, but I, even also among libertarians and conservatives, there's very little offered in a, you know, in, uh, as an alternative, really making people's lives better in, you know, day to day. Yeah. yeah. what you guys are up to, right? Yeah. At the local and, level. Yeah, exactly. And you can only do that at the local level. You can't do that by uh. fiat coming out of the beltway. What you can do is if, you live in a burb somewhere and they're hassling the shoeshine guy or attacking the hair weaver or, yeah, the little nail salon that's run by an immigrant from Vietnam, Mm. get the hell out of their way and let them do it. And if you change these one by one in your small community, it starts expanding out because it works. And then if you have a state that takes its boot off people's necks and it starts doing better economically and so forth, better quality of life, you're going to have people like uh, pro and con in Arizona, all the Californians fleeing, moving their businesses to Arizona, yep. uh, tech people with the self-driving cars. They all abandon California because of all restrictions here and there. And uh, the Arizona governor, um, Doug Ducey, he said, yeah, we're welcome here. You can do whatever you want. And uh, just, you know, be basically register it like you would register any kind of car and we're done. We don't need extra fees. We don't need all these different requirements. You don't need to share every inch of data you have and now in my neighborhood google cars their project's called waymo i see them driving around my neighborhood constantly you have uh, robots delivering groceries now a couple miles north of me it, it's wow. amazing to see and yeah you have a couple people whine because ooh, that's different therefore it's scary but it's been years every if i drive away from uh, my house a mile i'm going to see at least one of these cars usually several the only thing that's annoying about these self-driving cars is they're very cautious and i'm kind of a dick when i drive they do not respond to a middle finger at all <laughs> or a honk right <laughs> so but, let's back this up now hold on there are these little cars with no person in them driving all around the Phoenix area, delivering groceries. Yeah, delivering. It's a test program now. It's in Scottsdale, places probably like eight, ten miles north of me. I'm really hoping my my uh, local neighborhood store gets this. But yeah, they're just these little bots. They look like some out of sci-fi movies, and they just truck down the road. There's no place for a person to be. Uh, they have these gull wing doors, mm. and they pull up to your driveway. You pull out your groceries, and then they zip back to the store. That's for a, another delivery. That's amazing. I know. And that's what I want because I hate leaving my house. It's also the future. It is. So, it's yeah, it's simultaneously about movement and not movement. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but it's about, it is about movement though, uh-huh. right? It's about, because that's... The, you, it will fit your lifestyle better if I can yeah. just tap check boxes on a screen and mm-hmm. be done with my groceries until an hour later they show up at my door. I can get more stuff done, whatever I want to do. If I'm in the middle of a good book or I'm watching something on Netflix, I can do that instead of, you know, slamming into other carts in a grocery store. And the Arizona governor is, this is him. He's he's into this. Yeah, he's into this. Yeah, just opening it up. And he's pushing as far as he can on these things, Um, you know, and obviously some people just like it the old way. And I don't care which party, you know, people like it the old way. Let's protect our networks. Let's protect our old boy networks. But just trying to remove some of these regulations and restrictions, just get government out of the way so people can live their lives. Uh, Companies can try out new things. And the thing is, five years from now, self-driving cars might be a total bust. No, they don't work fine but at least you had a chance to try it out yep. you know and here are a couple applications we can use it for you know like the grocery delivery last time i checked i think it's thirty-five thousand people per year killed in cars in this mm-hmm. country is all right something like yeah. that yeah so no i cannot th- this cannot happen soon enough for me right mm-hmm. this is urgent for me mm-hmm. and you know because i have a 17 year old son yeah right who's about to start driving mm-hmm. i mean literally that's what's happening right now so it's very terrifying for me and uh so any politician who gets in the way of that and that's this the is, thing. This, California this is, this is when I'm yeah. the Malcolm X and you're the Martin Luther King. <laughs> right, Let me just put right. it that way. I, although I might even be more H. Rap Brown, actually, the guy who wanted to actually do something more. But anyway, um, that's amazing. I'm so happy. But I yeah. just wish these 
these mm, politicians, <laughs> who, especially in California, I mean, they just were doing everything to stop this from oh, happening. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, it, it's just funny. Anytime I, you know, I live in Arizona, and so come to California a lot, and every time I come here, there's more warning labels on crap, and it's just constantly. It's There's mm. more things. I remember when my girls were little going to Legoland, north of San Diego, and uh, my daughter asked me, what's a tumor? And I'm <laughs> like, what? Sounds like a Schwarzenegger line. Um, and I looked, and there was a warning label because she wanted to buy some cheap trinket lego jewelry and there was a warning that these products might contain they came from china therefore they might contain lead therefore they might cause cancerous Mm. tumors and uh you know my little kid's reading this she's just trying to buy a little souvenir Mm. it's just like warning labels on warning labels on warning labels that's one model and if you want to do that i'm a big believer in federalism knock yourself out see how it works uh but uh if washington gets out of the way arizona can do something different kansas can do something different vermont can do something different and we'll see what works yeah and so what doesn't and if you're happy with uh warning labels on everything you do in your life you're welcome to move to arizona and if you're not you can move to alaska yeah let's please know. let's please talk about this federalism yeah. thing which i know is your passion about yeah. and i i i don't federalism is not the way I talk about it, but I mm-hmm. think we're pretty in sync. Or, or right. We might have to do our Martin and Malcolm dance yeah. again, <laughs> but we'll see how this goes. Localism. Go um, for it. Yeah, Let's yeah, it. yeah. Federalism just, and, and I think Washington controls so much of our lives, federalism's the first step, but within a state, I want the crazy progressive town and the crazy conservative town, and mm-hmm. they can live right next to each yeah. other, and I can live, I can move between them yeah. based on, you know, I don't need all these services, or I want all these safety nets. Um, it's just, and just drill it down as far as you can. I, you know, you, you could even drill it down further than that, but I think it would be fantastic. You know, Phoenix has a lot of suburbs. It basically is one big suburb, and yeah, I have one. Uh, the town I live in, Mesa, was actually ranked the most conservative large city in the nation. Um, and that's great. And the town next to us, it's not progressive by California standards, but it's more progressive. It has Arizona State University, Tempe. And I live right on the border between the two. And I see the pros and cons of each. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll have one with almost no zoning and one that, mm-hmm. you know, puts warning labels on everything. And I think that's fantastic. And I don't understand why more people don't want that. And instead, not only town to town, um, but, you know, want the whole nation to conform to their views. I don't I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me uh, because I want people to live their lives the way they think is best. Mm-hmm. And in communities, if their community wants this overarching welfare state, all right, cool. I won't live there, but knock right. yourself out. I, I really, I, I don't get why any, well, everybody wouldn't want that. We'd be a lot, we wouldn't be at each other's throats as much. Well, I think you guys sure. are going even farther than that, aren't you? Like if California established a people's republic of communist utopia, whatever, right? Uh-huh went went full red you uh-huh. know let's say you guys not only would say that's okay you might even say and, and seceded right of course uh-huh. um you guys would say that's a good thing mm-hmm. overall a net positive right even right. though it's you have sort of a soviet union next door but <laughs> but right but that's kind of because yeah. simply because it's simply the act of breaking off seceding decentralizing right right, right? that's the thing yeah and i think that's and the more the better right the more the better and i think if uh i'm glad we have in the country california and texas and uh, people have the choice to choose between them um, if California wants to do their own thing, I think they were kind of confused. A lot of people after Trump was elected were like, hashtag Cal exit and we're going to leave. And most of the people I know. It was exciting. were like, cool, for, good for, for you guys. For about five minutes, right. they were saying this. And I was super excited, too. <laughs> right, right. But they didn't. And then, yeah, they and then people out. in California were like, ooh, well, ch- I thought you'd be very upset. It's they like, chickened no. out. I was yeah. like, wait, you guys are going to have a pretty good military, you know, right. <laughs> B- good economic base, you know. The infrastructure is pretty solid, uh-huh. you know. Populations, you know, well educated and good shape, you know, good right. fighters, you know, they'll uh-huh. be able to defend, defend their borders and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they're going to distribute all the goods equally, but whatever, give it a try, guys. But yeah. the point is, and I've said this to you before we started the, the microphones rolling, um, or whatever we do with the microphones, uh, <laughs> is that what's most important, I think, for us, for those of us who believe in this and want this, is to continually push and insist that there be fluid or no boundaries or borders between these places, right? Mm-hmm. So that it's easy to come and go, right? right? Right, So like, you know, I was a California resident until about six months ago. And so if they had gone full commie, I just want to be able to leave. It, right, exactly. Right? And exactly. I also want to maybe visit too, mm-hmm. come and check it out and see how it works here. And maybe they will convince me that I've been wrong all these years <laughs> uh-huh. or that I was right when I was a kid, when I was a socialist, you know, uh-huh. and we'll see. But I, I love that, right? Because 
this is one of those many, 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 many things that the left just doesn't know about the right. That this is one of those things where like, huh? Because they would assume you'd be opposed to it and probably mm-hmm. want to drop nuclear bombs on it, actually. But you guys are just like, no, go for it. Yeah. Have, yeah. have your people's republic. Exactly. And, and that's my thing. It, just as you said, if I'm wrong, I want to know I'm wrong. So why wouldn't I give you room to try out some crazy experiment? If, if single payer works, I want Vermont to try yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, if a state wants, you know, whatever it is, I, I kind of want 50 labs of democracy around the country and see what works and see what doesn't. And if I'm full of crap, prove it to me. You can do that. You have the flexibility to do that. You know what it is? It's the opposite of imperialism. Mm-hmm. It's the opposite. What do you guys think of the founding fathers over at Ricochet? Um, very pro founding fathers. Okay. Probably depends on the one. And I think we would probably disagree about the best way to go. You know, we have our mm. Thomas Paines and our Jeffersons and our Hamiltons. So um, I think it would really, I think what was what's most exciting about them is not e- any of their ideas, but the free debate. I think mm-hmm. that's the coolest thing about the Founding Fathers mm-hmm. is they could hash these things out on a high level, in public, and uh, the occasional duel. But I, I think that's a lot more interesting than one guy saying, okay, this is what I want everybody to live under. Yeah, because they weren't really federalists in this way. In fact, no, they were the opposite no. of it, Yeah, right? Because uh-huh. from the get-go, they yeah. had a vision yeah. of this entire landmass mm-hmm. of North America belonging to one single sovereign nation. Exactly. Yes, that they controlled. Mm-hmm. That's Jefferson, Washington, Adams, yep. Franklin, all of them. All good, of them. you know this. Okay, good. Because yeah. Right. Yeah. a lot of people here don't know this. Yeah. Um, Thomas and, Paine was the outlier, so we yes, went to Paris. <laughs> correct. But that's why he wasn't one of the founding <laughs> exactly. fathers. Exactly. That's right. Um, he was the, the guy they were embarrassed at at the office party. And I didn't really know this until I started. I've been writing a book about the history of American foreign policy, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I, so I went back to them. And I had studied them before about other issues, but I'd mm-hmm. never dug deep on their ideas about empire. Oh, they, were, they wanted to be, they wanted oh, yeah, to be yeah. Caesar. Exactly. Every one of them. They wanted and then it to... continued on through Manifest Destiny. Yeah, and this exactly. Is, God has given us this continent. And, exactly. Yeah. And so you guys are going in exactly the opposite direction. You're like rolling it back <laughs> right. all the way back to the Plymouth Rock, right? You're right, decent, right. Right? Yeah. Because that was the thing. They just said, okay, this is the United States. And everybody in this landmass was like, a what? Did we get to choose this? I mean, some people did. A yeah. tiny, tiny little minority of people chose mm-hmm. to be in the United States. But all the Indians and the slaves and the blacks mm-hmm. and the indentured servants and the Irish immigrants and all those people. Uh-huh. I doubt they were super stoked to have this new identity thrust upon them. Right. The, it, it, and the, th- the thing is, too, the thing that's most interesting about America is these cultural pockets all over the place. And yeah. that's one we kind of have this, you know. That's why we love it so much. Oh, right? yeah. That's why you yeah. and I love it so much. But it's, yeah. like, it's like you look at, uh, it's basically America generica. You know, hmm. if I go to, I don't know, a group of stores, I'll just call them malls, and that's what they're usually called. Now those are fading away. But if I go to one in uh, Georgetown or I go to one in Fairbanks or I go to one in mm. Tempe, Arizona, it's all the same mm-hmm. crap, and which sucks because before when I traveled, I loved finding all the regional oddities and mm-hmm. strangeness and weird cultural glitches. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's another thing no, with federalism. I'd like to see more of that. But it's reverting back, I think. I think there's more because everybody can make their own stuff now. So mm-hmm. everyone's an artisan now, right? Yeah. There's all kinds of that kind of my independent. Kids, a, a good example, my kids um, I just needed some clothes for school. And so I offered to take them to the store. And my youngest said, uh, no, I, I already found out what I want on Etsy. And it was, <laughs> you know, and she found, uh, she likes good music. So she found a Bauhaus shirt and she found uh, some pants that she thought were cool. And sorry, it was all. I'm sorry, excuse me. Bauhaus is good music? Is that? Uh, yeah, well, she's getting into dad's old music, and she's introducing me to bands that I listened to in the 80s, Bauhaus and Joy Division and all that stuff. I, I, ask, I, I, I ask again, is Bauhaus good music? I, you said that so declaratively. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, I well, see. yeah, okay. yeah they Objectively. are. Bela Lugosi's dead. That's a, gotcha. that's a seminal work in post-punk. Gotcha. Okay, proven, yeah. proven, proven. <laughs> proven. <laughs> um, but yeah, she just found all this stuff on her own. It's like, no, I want yes. this shirt from this yes. seller, these pants from this other seller. And I was, I was confused at first. I was like, oh, this is great. This is awesome. You know, because it's, yeah, it's just all stuff that she individually liked. She didn't go to the Gap or Old Navy or wherever you would go for stuff. Yeah, right. So the future's looking good Mm -hmm. unless we blow the world up. Right. I'm against that. I was going to say, let's let's talk about your past now, (laughs) because that that that, now that's relevant. (laughs) You spent some time in a place that I think 
is my worst nightmare. I think it's, I think this is probably the last place on earth I would want to be. Well, no, where those, those Thai boys, that cave they were in, uh-huh. that's the last place I want to be. Right. Where you were for some of six years, but for a long time during that six years is the second worst, which was a, a, su- a submarine in the United States Navy. Right. So what, what, how do you do that? Like, great is, times, great times. Yeah. The, um, how does one, how, how does a human being, <laughs> you know what I mean? Acculturate to that environment. You go a little crazy. Yeah. I oh, think oh, that's really? the key. You need to. Huh. Yeah. You, you have to have some kind of benign insanity to uh, stick with it. Uh, w- one thing that I noticed, you know, I joined right out of high school and I was on a fast tax sub out of Pearl Harbor. And it was, I was planning when I joined, because I'm a dumb kid, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, I'm going to do this as a career, you know, join enlisted, go to officer's candidate school, stick with it. Second week on the sub, I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, I think we're done here. I think uh, I won't be re-enlisting. I miss the sun. I miss females because at the time they were so totally they, all male. And so did they just shoot you out of one of the torpedo <laughs> yeah, tubes? To Is get rid how? of me. To get rid of me. Yeah, but it was... No, you a, had to stay. I mean, was, was it two months, you said, underwater? Yeah, the longest... Uh, this was fast tech. Uh, the missile subs will stay under two, maybe up to three months. I don't know what they're at now. Um, the longest we did was two months. Two months underwater. underwater. Yeah. And you, you do, it really, 10 days is when you get kind of the equivalent of cabin fever and people start acting really crazy. Um, but yeah, you you get used to it. But what it's like is like you're living in a machine. They have this massive metal machine and they carve out little spaces for humans to walk around in it and sleep and eat. And uh, you are way down on the totem pole of importance, the humans. Uh, they just carve out little cubby holes for you to live in, essentially, in this gigantic machine of war. So <laughs> it was it was a fascinating experience. Um, I realized it was not for me, definitely for a career, but it was pretty amazing. And it makes me appreciate uh, being able to hike in the mountains now and uh, see the sunshine. That's for damn sure. Did you ever see Das Boot? Oh, yes. That oh, was yes. the one, right? That yes. was the thing. Very realistic. That was when I one realized. One of the few realistic de- depictions of sub life. And obviously, that was those were war subs in uh, World War II, but it, it got the claustrophobia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so how small is it in there? That's what I want to know. It's not terrible. Um, if you're six foot or taller, you're going to be bumping your head a lot. I'm 5'10". I bump my head a lot, uh, slamming into things. Um so it's it's pretty small. It's nothing like DOS boot. It's it's much larger than that. If you're on a ballistic like an SSBN, it's a ballistic missile sub. It's much larger. I've toured those mm. as well, but it's restricted. And it, one thing, just a basic <laughs> basic effect I had. My eyes were kind of shaky when I went in there. It was like 2060, I think, was my vision. By the time I got off my off the sub, it was 2400 mm. because the doctor says you never focus at a long distance ever. Mm. And it's like you're in the sub for just even a week and you come out of the hatch after a week and I'd see the mountains in the dif- distance in Hawaii and your eyes are just like very confused for a while. It's mm. just like, what? Oh yeah, something's far away. So everything you're focused on is up close. Mm. Uh, so, and that doesn't affect everyone, but it's very common with people on sub. So it was a weird environment. Um, what were the specific psychological effects that you witnessed? or experienced. Yeah, I would say um, a good example, and I will not give any names, but uh, I, I remember the first time I was on a sub and we hit the 10-day crazy point and there was a guy uh, hanging on a light fixture uh, by his arms and legs um, above the the galley, the mess area where you actually eat, and he was sticking out his tongue at everybody, and he, did, he was up there for about six hours, and I said... I talked to a guy who had been around a while, and I said, what, what's he doing? He goes, oh, he's a gecko. And then I noticed every time we went on a deployment at the 10-day point, he would be hanging from that again and would be a gecko, and then everything would be fine after six uh, after uh, six hours or so. And it was just his way of blowing off steam or something. He's a hilarious guy. He's a great guy. But um, – People just have all, all, all these crazy rituals. You just see people. Um, and if you have something, like I, I've always been, you know, dealing with anxiety, depression, and stuff like that. If you have that, it's obviously going to trigger that, But um, which, which is what I dealt with. But everybody else just lets off steam in different ways. Hmm. It's, it's an odd and very odd environment. Very well, thankful I experienced well, it just because it really changes your perspective. Well, thank God they don't give them any weapons. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we just spread peace and love throughout the Cold War. 
So you were not on a nuclear sub. Um, I was a reactor operator on our oh, sub. Oh, you were we on We did not have, Nuclear yeah, powered. Yeah, nuclear powered, not nuclear, not nuclear armed. weapon. Yeah, not yeah. nuclear armed, as okay. far as we know. So you weren't one of the in one of those ultra death machines right, that can destroy right. all of I was a Eurasia in one right. shot. Yeah. And we, you know, this was during the Cold War, so. so what did you have on there for the weapons? Uh, you... Torpedoes. Oh, I see. Just And then later cruise missiles you could have for, on there as well. To attack other boats. Right, okay. right. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Not, so it not, was it not was to mostly, wipe out all of China. No, right. No. That's for the other. But stories. it was mostly to you know just track Russian shipping. Um, yeah, this was the Cold War. Yeah, Cold this War. This was the last maybe. six years. Uh -huh. You were there for exactly the last six years, yeah. basically, of the Cold War, right? When I joined the Navy, the Cold War was hot, and the Soviet Union these was very strong. And by the time I got out, they were dead. So I'm not taking all the credit. Eighty-four but, to ninety, right? Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was you. Right. Well, pretty no, much. It was you and Jack Ryan. <laughs> I'm right. pretty sure. I'll give him a little credit. I mean, he's a pretty cool guy. He's uh -huh. very brave. Yeah. More brave than you. I'm way more handsome. But you had, yeah. You, you had anxiety yeah. issues. Yeah. You you weren't going to save the world. <laughs> but that is something. You know, it's funny. Uh, me, little socialist kid from Berkeley. I, it was sort of a romantic time for at least when I was in, a teenager and early in college. Even then, there was something about the Cold War that was kind of cool. This is all right. Hollywood's fault, of exactly. course. Exactly. For making it cool, but it really, I remember having sort of just romantic, just general feelings about mm -hmm. it, kind of wanting to be Jack Ryan in a way, even though, of course. Well, the was, whole world of espionage was a lot more interesting back then because, yeah, and it right. was boring in the day to day, mm -hmm. but it was fascinating with the unknowns. Well, they were also way less scary than our enemies now. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Soviets by the end were pretty much comic books. <laughs> right. You know, it was just like cartoon characters running around with funny uniforms on. I was there in 87. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I actually, uh, for two weeks, and I ended up. I hanging. think by the the end it was just the flaws were so apparent yeah you know yeah it was i was there in 87 and like we were taken immediately to an underground rock and roll oh, really? place where they had like just taken over some abandoned building and made it mm -hmm. into their own nightclub and they had there was a guy who looked just like elvis costello on stage <laughs> and they had a whole rock band and people were dancing and they were taken to like another like some apartment that had been left behind and the kids had taken it over and it was like a party like a rave uh -huh. spot basically wow. but then the cops showed up and put them all in a paddy wagon and sent them. We never saw them again. Wow. And they checked our passports and let us go. Uh -huh. But they had these big old Soviet army uniforms on. I don't know. It was like soldiers or the cops here. But it was all, I mean, it was horrible and terrible. But compared to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, right? Yeah. It was, it was still considered to be sort of fun to be involved in this Cold War thing, right? In any, on any level. Whereas it wouldn't be fun to go hang out in the Middle East now well, you, and, and go to underground rock shows maybe, right? Yeah. It, it seems like there was... Uh... A guy in charge and who is ultimately rational, and now we're dealing with all these groups who don't seem rational, or at least we can't figure out their line of thinking as easily. Well, yeah, and they basically have a gangster mentality about yeah. violence, right, mm -hmm. which is that there is no limit to it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, okay, so you're on the sub with a bunch of crazy guys uh, with lots of weaponry uh, <laughs> trolling the waters of the Pacific. Yeah, Pacific. Looking for other Soviet subs and boats to mm -hmm. maybe possibly shoot at or at least can keep them contained. Yes. What was the deal? Like, did they have – you must have had particular lines of demarcation if they crossed. It was a problem. Like, you were making sure they were staying within their zone? <sighs> well, nobody really held to their zone. Hmm. You just – just want to keep an eye on people oh. um there was yeah it, it's like it, the basic role the the basic uh work of the day was utter drudgery but mm. there were some fascinating moments there mm. where one side went where they weren't supposed to go and vice versa i might add mm -hmm. so that was that was, those were the memorable times and then what you give a signal to them or you communicate with them um if you want uh, usually um at, at the time it was hard for them to find us and easier for us to find them. So we would just make sure that they wouldn't do anything crazy or just mostly mostly just where are they and, oh, okay, that's where this sub is at and just kind of track them and keep an eye on them and make – and sometimes just letting them know through different means by emitting some sound that, oh, crap, we're being followed. Maybe we should uh, right. get out of here. But the, the technology was superior on the American side. Yes, yes. Right, everything was superior. Right, right. Would have wiped them out if they would actually gone to war. Pretty right? much, yeah. 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 Um, and, and also, too, you just kind of have the, you know, communism does not build great products. Yes, so exactly. They would have many more accidents and the like. They, That's right. Yeah, didn't really care about that. That's right. Okay, so you call yourself a conservatarian, mm -hmm. right? And ricochet guys generally do. Is that your thing? No, I think, yeah, I'm... 
I don't know. I'm probably the only guy who defines myself as conservatarians. Okay. I, I so. think you have uh, different uh, center-right Republicans there. I'm of no party, of no tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the best the best description would be conservatarian that I can come up with. So a hybrid of conservative and libertarian. Right. I haven't heard anything conservative out of you yet. What's conservative about you? I think um, a lot of that is philosophical. Mm-hmm. Just um, the whole Chesterton, Chesterton's fence idea of before you tear down a fence, make sure you know why it was put up in the first place. Mm. Um, that, that's kind of he's like, there's a reason this fence was here. It might be a bogus reason, but find that out before you start tearing down the old fence. Oh, nice. And that's kind of my inherent conservative. I, I think part of it, too, is just coming from, you know, I was, you know, joining the Navy at high school during the Reagan years. Um, even other Navy guys jokingly called me Reagan youth because uh, I was like younger than everybody in the nuclear power program. And uh, but as you get older and you see politicians disappoint you one after the another, one after the other, uh, you kind of realize, you know what, maybe these politicians aren't our moral superiors and we should uh, take away as much power from them as possible. So it, it's one of those things every year I get more and more libertarian. Hmm. Uh, but I think um, that I... Hmm. It, I, I think, too, it, it's kind of difficult. Uh, we were discussing before we got on this quadrant of where you are on social issues and fiscal issues. And you have this lonely quadrant where if I do these tests, I always pop up in as the socially liberal, fiscally conservative guy. But what's strange is uh, in my personal life, I'm totally socially conservative. However, I don't want government to impose that on anyone else. I have absolutely no interest on telling other people how to live their life. Um, So I just want government out of those decisions. And so maybe that's part of the the conservative part of me is just in my personal life. But once again, I don't want to – I have no interest in forcing that on other people Mm -hmm. because not only – does that do these people no good? It doesn't help me at all to force people to live the way I live. But anytime the government tries to impose that, either from the left or the right, they screw it up. There's unintended consequences. There's all sorts of things that go wrong. Uh, so the government just needs to stay out of those decisions. So what are what are your positions on foreign policy? Foreign policy, I'm really changing because I think before that cold warrior thing, I think I just was born into this imperial mentality mm-hmm. where – we need to patrol the shipping lanes. We need to keep the world safe for democracy and things like that. But again, more and more, look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, the eternal war. Um, I don't see that helping, certainly not helping the people in the Middle East, but it's not helping us either. I don't I don't get the point of what we're trying to protect there um, instead of just letting people live their lives and run the government the way they see fit. Hmm. So that's something I've gotten less and less interventionist over the years. Before, I was just like, oh, yeah. America, F, yeah, Team America, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is fantastic. And now I just think we do more harm than good, especially if you look at American involvement with um, – I did a lot of research. I did a lot of Latin American history when I was in college, and um, I, I had roommates from Haiti. And looking at how America has intervened in Haiti, Haiti would be getting worse and worse, and then American would, America would go in to fix it. And then we would make it worse still, and then we would leave, and then it would get worse still. Mm-hmm. A good example is in the earliest, early 20th century, we went to Haiti, and it's like, okay, let's modernize this country like we're doing in Kabul. Uh, let's build some highways. Let's build some infrastructure. Then America left after 20 years of doing no good. Then the Duvaliers came to power, and they say, oh, cool, look at all this infrastructure. We can bring troops from hmm. – Port-au-Prince to the hinterlands, we could never reach them before. Mm. And so it made it very easy for them to suppress the population. So it's like, okay, that's awesome that we made all those highways and bridges and connected the country. Mm. Now it was very easy for one madman to take control of it and oppress the population. So the more you look at things like that. So I'm really undecided. I I think um, Mm. the, the answer every year that I enjoy giving more and more is I don't know. Yeah, um, me too. Because before, you know, especially a teenager knows everything. Mm-hmm. And what I see a lot of the world's like, yeah, I don't know what the limits of our power should be. But I do know that a lot of times we get involved. And often a lot of the people involved, you have a lot of jerks who are just doing it for oil or money or whatever. You have some people who are altruists who really want, we really want to help these people, bring them freedom, whatever that might mean to that person. Um, but even with good intentions, they go awry. 
and uh, you end up creating problems that will bite you back down the road. Mm -hmm. I, I see, you know, what we did in Haiti in the earliest 20th century with connecting and modernizing the country um, was it was turned against the populace the second we left. And uh, now that we're talking about leaving Afghanistan, finally, as we have sons replacing fathers on duty in Kandahar or wherever they're um, assigned to, um, when we leave now the Taliban or whomever, whichever group, now they'll have all this great infrastructure and all these weapons left behind because we won't bring them all home. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll have those to play with, just like ISIS had all our post-Iraq weapons to play with. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you were a Navy man because the Navy has always been, I think, strategically, always been considered by the big foreign policy thinkers to be the most important wing of the military. That mm -hmm. that if you had the biggest Navy, you were going to basically control the world. Yeah, yeah. Since Admiral Alfred Mahan, Mahan back yeah. in the nineteenth century, and sea then Frank, power, and Franklin right. Roosevelt after him, but everyone since then. And mm -hmm. the, a, a recent Secretary of the Navy, I forget which one. I think it was under Obama. Just he just got on stage and something. He says, "Yeah, the U.S. Navy alone." is the most powerful entity in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Don't mess with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's right. Right. I think. Now, the argument that has been made against my side, um, which wants immediate withdrawal of everything from everywhere, <laughs> pretty much, you know, um, is that we need uh, what's called a blue water navy, basically, mm -hmm. to make sure that trade lines, shipping lines are op kept open, mm -hmm. you know, against pirates and nationalists who want to close off right. parts of the world in various ways to trade. I, I respect the argument. I don't like it and I want to defeat it, but I, I got to say for it. But I got to say to you, John, <laughs> I had to drive here from Arizona so that you could answer this for me. Do we need that? Is that true? Like, and can, is there any way to make an argument against that? I don't know. This is Donald Trump's whole thing, right? By right. the way, he also is part of this. Mm hmm. Mr. Not so anti imperialist. <laughs> that's his argument about China. Like, that's he wants a huge Navy buildup all through the South China Sea to control the shipping lanes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, what, what do you, and I think, I think, I don't yeah. see any other option other than, hmm. you, you know, you're going to need a cop on, on the seas to keep things flowing, but I don't like it either. It doesn't make sense that we're the ones paying for all this mm -hmm. and we're the one uh, taking it all up. But you could have a situation where China could just shut down all trade from between Asia and the U.S. if they had control of that. Um, I, again, it's very difficult. It would be great if we could have some kind of international commission. Everybody take take control of their sphere of interest, let's say. You could have Japan, you know, patrolling a lot of the Pacific and us patrolling part of the Atlantic and Latin American countries doing, doing the like down there. Hmm. Um, but if there isn't one arbiter uh, just keeping everything open, before that you had the British Empire. Right. Um, you're one. going to yeah exactly there's always one cop has been yeah, uh-huh right. yeah patrolling and when you didn't have that you did have piracy like the Maluka Straits and of course yeah. we're seeing off the Horn of Africa you're going to have all these uh localists who uh don't don't aren't big fans of free exactly trade. yeah <laughs> so now we're killing ourselves <laughs> right John come right. on man we're killing our own people here suddenly <laughs> Well, first of all, we want to take the nuclear weapons off those ships first, don't we, while we're doing that? I mean, that's our position, you and mine. Like, that's, oh, well, yeah, I don't. If we're going to have, need if we're going to gonna need a blue water Navy, like I want, I don't want them to have nuclear missiles that can destroy continents, mm -hmm. right? So number one. So I, I mean, I still am, I think I'm opposed to this, but it's a compelling argument. Right. And right. All we, the thing is, we don't know any different, right? Because mm -hmm. as we were just saying, you know, it was the yeah. Spanish, then it was the British, and then it was yep. the Americans. Right. And so we, we've we never, don't know. We don't yeah. know. And that was, you know, it started during the mercantilist days. So mm -hmm. who knows what in, the, in our modern economy, who knows what would happen? Mm -hmm. It might be great. I'm, I'm totally leaving that option yeah. open that because it's in everybody's self-interest exactly. to stay the hell away from ships. And, yeah, you might have some, you know, small people, a pirate here, a pirate there. But the local authorities would it would be in their interest as well to get rid of them because right. otherwise they're never going to get the new car ship to their port in Jakarta or wherever. Or their shipping industries. Right. Have their exactly. Own private security, which could exactly. wipe out any Somali pirate band, right? Right. Yeah. No, it's an interesting question, though, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I and mean, this is a huge... We don't know what it would what would happen, but it would be a fascinating experiment if there's any way we could do I it. I mean, this is maybe the biggest question of them all right now, <laughs> right? I mean, if uh -huh. we, you know, if my side wins, you know, this, mm -hmm. that's what would happen. We'd right. pull all those ships out of the water, and I'm not sure uh -huh. what would happen. I yeah. think it'll be good. Yeah. Or at least, I should say, a net positive. Right, right. Of course people will get killed, yeah. but they're going to get killed anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Fewer, Who's doing the killing fewer, is basically, yeah. And, and a general net increase in freedom mm -hmm. overall, I think. Right. But 
it's it's just I'm just saying it's when I'm out on the edge of the cliff there. It's uh-huh. one of those what's one of those positions. On some things I'm very clear. On this one I'm just like I think so, but I I gotta say we've never had anything different. And uh-huh. also, you know, we have a lot of nice stuff these days, which I think the Navy has helped get here, <laughs> right, right, right from China. Yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff came from China, and I and think it's so yeah. lopsided. The the U.S. Navy is so lopsided because you'll hear about a Russian car- uh, carrier getting involved in Syria or something like that. But you know, that thing is literally being carried by tugboats through certain sections. Um, we're really the only functional global blue water navy, mm-hmm. and it, we're so far ahead nobody even dares try. Um, if that disappears for some reason, it would it would it would be pretty fascinating mm-hmm. to watch. I hope uh, the Pentagon is doing some uh, using some of my money to uh, check out how that would work. I'm sure they'd come out with how the military is more important than ever because they're the Pentagon. But it, it would be fascinating to see some uh, game theory propositions totally. on how it would play out. And if if an area, you know, say Malacca Straits or, you know, for 500 years have been piracy, probably well before that, before Western powers got there. But um, it, it would be fascinating to see if they didn't control those shipping lanes and keep them free and open. Uh, Indonesia, which is a, you know, pretty massive economy, they would lose so badly, it seems like it would be their interest to patrol their own shores. So, Yeah. So yeah, they, they, they scared me with this China talk and this Belt Road talk. Uh-huh. You know, I saw some video, I think Vox or something, just basically intending to scare me into right. wanting to go to war with China, <laughs> which of course is what Trump wants or something like that. But yeah, so the Belt Road is an, an amazing thing. I mean, mm-hmm. they're building, they just signed a deal with, I think, Italy. So they're going to have, uh-huh. they now have basically, or they're soon going to have a road that goes all the way from, right, it's like the Shanghai classic, yeah. to the... It's the classic Silk Road, which was first, you know, had its inklings, 1000 BCE. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's always been... A system and it would be madness for China not to do this. But they're building ports all around right. Southern Asia and in Africa mm-hmm. and railroads and and roads for automobiles and possibly tanks. <laughs> exactly. Aren't they, John? Exactly. Infrastructure <laughs> has pros and cons. And so I got real nervous and I was like, wait a minute. Hold on. China's coming. Uh, should I check? So I looked at their military. I, I, and there's mm-hmm. these great websites where you can actually, they sort of do visual graphics and you can see the actual relative power, right? And it's mm-hmm. like... It was like the United, I forget, but it was sort of like the United States had basically like five to ten times more stuff in every category, mm-hmm. right? It's like nuclear subs, tanks, armies, right. and, and the Air Force, forget about it. Yeah, like yeah. no one's touching that. But the Navy alone, it was just, just I didn't realize the gap was that big between us and everyone else. Right. right. Even China with it all was those resources. The Cold War. Sure. Yeah. Let alone, yeah, now it's just. But, Ridiculous. But long term, <laughs> what are those people up to? Uh-huh. Do we have any idea? Um, What's their intention? Right. I don't know. And the thing is, China is, you know, there's been, if you look at their history, there's been brief flirtations with at least economic imperialism, but they've been very short lived. And it's in, you know, throughout their history, going back again, just thousands of years. Uh, very insular and very mm-hmm. concerned about what's important is this middle kingdom. This is what's important, and the rest of the world can come to us when they mm-hmm. want to, and we will entertain them and give them gifts and baubles and maybe trade with them if they're nice. Um, so they've never had this imperial Im- impulse. Well, it's been very, very well, limited. Um, you've had people associated with them, Mongolians. They definitely had that. But um, now they see it's in their economic interest to create a sphere of influence. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what the leaders do, but also they're on a collision course with their population because they can't keep this inflated growth going forever. Right. And the people are going to get tired of them eventually. Um, so it's really up in the air. If you had an extreme nationalist, if you had an yes. imperialist, if you had someone who was like, look, we got to take care of ourselves. That would probably be the best option from an American perspective and for all their neighbors. But we don't know. And the the current kind of this weird communist capitalist hybrid that they have, it can't last. I don't think it can last much longer. Uh, What will replace it is utterly beyond me. Mm -hmm. What the United States was in 1939, Mm -hmm. China might be now, meaning the the imminent superpower Mm -hmm. with the economic power to create a military superpower Mm -hmm. hegemon. And yeah, I'm nervous. Although you're right, the history of China is very it's comforting uh, mm-hmm. because they've they've been on the other end of this. They've been right. they've been the victims of imperialism, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Very little, as you were saying, very little imperial adventures right, outside right. their borders. And that's the thing. They've kind of stretched, and when they've stretched in the past, it's been mostly for commerce, mm-hmm. and um, it would just be under one or two emperors where they'd extend their influence through 
uh, Southeast Asia, all the way to India, but that's about it. Africa? It was just like, they're big, yeah. They're yeah. big in Africa. Yep, yep, yep. Getting the oil down there. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, if it's just to get, <laughs> you know, bigger skyscrapers uh-huh. and better smartphones, yay. Uh-huh. I'm just saying, right, once, right. once you, especially look where they are, right? It's like the Middle East and Africa, and that's where all the oil is, mm-hmm. and they got all the ports now. Right, and right. once they get a Navy, I'm just saying, <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Trump, but you might have a point here. I mean, honestly, we have to be serious. You know, right. the anti-war, anti-imperialist people that I hang out with, who mm-hmm. I am one of, you know, that's – Something that really needs to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading some article by some Trump people. He some, uh, managed to find a couple of people with degrees to write an article on his behalf about China. There's one you can find. Show China. To. Uh, yeah. And they, were, they laid out this argument. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, OK. It's at least a coherent argument that's somewhat compelling and somewhat scary. I don't know what the hell to do except keep those – maybe those subs in the water. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going back on one. Good. That's all that's important. They will be, they will be absent one John right. Gabriel. Okay, cool. So what's the – you said something about being on a sub with anxiety and depression issues? That seems like a bad mix. Oh, that's where I found out I had anxiety oh. and depression issues. Well, that was one of the reasons I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be uh, signing up for – I don't think I'll be re-enlisting. But it, it's one of those things that's not you know terrible with me. It's uh, just an uptight – white dude from phoenix and everybody in my family has the same the same issues but it's it's really interesting is just everybody's issues come out on the sub just because it's a pressure cooker sure especially you know you're sleeping next to a reactor it's kind of a tense environment yeah 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 yeah. and knowing that yeah pinhole in the wall and you're all dead so Mm -hmm. yeah but see your brand as we started the show you know your brand is the happy guy the the one the one political guy who's actually seems to be enjoying life (laughs) so now we're going a little off brand right i want to hear what's going on here i mean what is your you want to talk about this your your psychological history and and oh yeah um basically Everybody. Just how happy are you, John? Oh, yeah. It's, Between uh, one and ten. <laughs> um, it varies day to day. I would say I'm usually, I'm rarely ecstatic, so I would say I'm probably at a seven usually. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, but, yeah, but I, I, I try to keep it there. Uh, I think Abraham Lincoln, who was... Bipolar, I think, was he? Um, said happiness is a choice. And mm. that's kind of what I do. And especially in this industry, dealing with politics all day and the idiocy and the craziness, yeah. it's like you can be mad about it or you can laugh at it. And I will always opt to laugh at it. Oh, yeah. So your so, book, this is your book you're working on. Now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do yeah, this. So I, this, uh, this is what it's all about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Outrage. I will, yeah. I will need to get this book done um, and find a publisher and then become rich beyond my wildest dreams and relocate to Oregon. But uh, yeah, just um, about halfway through writing it now, working on the politics of outrage and how taking offense is insane. Uh, Working title, and this will not be the title because it'll have to be about 300 words long the way Mm. they title things now, but just no offense, how you should never Mm. take offense at anything. It's in your self-interest not to be offended or outraged at pretty much anything. Um, for any reason. And I don't understand why so many people, especially on the internet, give in to outrage Mm -hmm. and taking offense. And you saw this before. It was like, ah, look at those crazy SGWs getting offended and pretending pretending they're victims all the time. And uh, more and more, especially in 2016, it became apparent that people on the right do the exact same thing. They're offended. And Mm -hmm. how dare this company not sell guns anymore? (laughs) How dare this guy ban people with MAGA hats? And, uh, how, dare, get, how dare this guy say, call me names. Right, right. right? That's yeah. what's going on now. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, you cannot let other people control your emotions. You cannot. And, and I think that's part of it, too, is just dealing with depression, anxiety, and stuff with, with me is just you kind of come to the stoic mentality, and it's you know repeated by modern psychology and all that, is just you cannot give other people influence over your feelings. You can only be offended if you choose to be offended. And you have to take an insult and say, wow, that really hurts my feeling because that guy called me short or he called me tall or he called me fat or he called me skinny. Um, I look at the person making the insult and I usually just laugh about it and I laugh at them and I don't take it seriously because I don't care, Um, especially if it's some stranger on the Internet who says – by pushing uh, – in the school choice article you wrote, you know, you're owned by the Koch brothers. That's always the first one to come. And uh, you're doing – you know, you're an idiot. You're stupid. I could look at that and go, well, that wasn't very nice. Mm-hmm. Or I could say, damn, that guy's an idiot. Mm-hmm. And I'll always go to, damn, that guy's an idiot. And if he wants to uh, assault me further, I strongly encourage him to write an article and I'll promote the hell out of that article because I would like to discuss it. If I'm wrong, I want to know that I'm wrong. 
but I don't understand taking offense. Um, I, I think the key really is you can only get offended, you can only get outraged if you give that issue, that person, the power over your emotional state. And I don't yeah. have enough time in the day to do that. Yeah. Let's stay with this for a second. This is something I'm just curious about, this, mm-hmm. this phenomenon of being offended. Mm-hmm. First of all, I wonder if that's just a modern invention. Is that a modern phenomenon? Did it? Did, were people offended before the 20th century? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. And I think not in this way. I don't right, think. right. Not in this way. But I think part of it is if you're restricted to your little village or something like that, everybody's going to be on the same page for most mm-hmm. things. Um, and but I mean, but now it doesn't. It doesn't make sense that you would. <laughs> okay. I, I think ultimately is, okay, this other person doesn't agree with you or he wore a shirt you don't like or made a movie that you weren't or, thrilled or, about. Or, a says, a w- or, or says a word that you feel is somehow an attack on your very being. Exactly. Right? Yeah. First off, it's not about you. Right. Secondly, why do you care that that person thinks differently, right. acts differently, wears something differently, has a different attitude? It right. has no effect on me whatsoever. And I don't understand people thinking it does have an effect. Um, and, and it's just become this outrage industry. Also, too, you have the power dynamic because now people who consider themselves victims, victims are like, oh, this is a cheap way for me to gain power over a situation. If I'm a college student and I am a trans woman from Pakistan and I realize I can get a better grade or maybe a scholarship out of it, hell yeah, I'm going to play into that. Hmm. It's no problem. But um, so you wonder how much of the offense is performative hmm. Hmm. Um, in, a power, in power dynamics and how much of it is true. And I think a lot of people, especially, you know, online, you see this constantly, but in politics, in the news cycle, I think people are really emotionally upset because they're, they're encountering someone with a different idea about yep. how the world works. And yep. I, I legitimately, uh, writing this book is me trying to understand how anybody could <laughs> think that's <laughs> healthy because being outraged, it has no effect. If you're outraged at me about something I wrote or said or did or wore, that has absolutely no effect on me. Why on earth would it have an effect on you? Right. Why are you in a bad mood tonight instead of just, you know— making out with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, um, watching a cool show or sleeping. Mm. I want you doing that, not being mad at me or anyone else because you're miserable and this world needs less miserable people. So let's speculate. We can never prove what's going on in these Uh people's heads. But what do you think? Why are they doing this? I think a lot of the leaders of victimization groups um, see it as a, a, a way, a leverage for power. Um, to uh, get additional powers, additional respect, whatever. I think most people are just surprised that people disagree with them. And they think, watching other people, that they're supposed to be offended by it. Um, They can show they're a member of Tribe A if they're offended. If you voted for Trump and somebody, some guy on the other side of the country is being, he got his hat knocked off by somebody else, you internalize that and say, hey, that's my tribe. You're attacking someone in my tribe. I think I have the benefit of not being a tribe of one. Um, if I see someone who agrees with me who's attacked in Denver, I, well, it sucks. But other than that, I don't care. It's mm-hmm. like, is, can I help this person? No. All right, I'm done. Um, I think it's making people painfully miserable and they need to get out of it. Again, just take politics out of it, take the news cycle out of it, take race, sexuality, gender issues, all that, take all that out of it. It's making you unhappy, so why are you continuing it? Um, I always just look at things, and this is kind of the stoic philosophy I did way too much reading in, but um, Hmm. looking at your sphere of control, what Hmm. do I have control over, what do I not have control over? Um, And that's how I look at any issue. If I'm outraged that there's a homeless problem in my, in my community. I can go to a soup kitchen. I can go to the city council. I can work on it. Or I can bitch about it, mm-hmm. and I don't let myself bitch about it. If I'm not willing to get off my ass and work to fix it, then obviously I don't care enough about it, so why worry about it? Um, but I, I think things would be much better and also have more local control as if someone was outraged about issue A that they got off their ass and did something about it. Um, because if you're unwilling to get off your ass and do something about it, you don't care about it. You just want to look like you care to strangers online. What if someone said that people named Gabriel are hot in- intellectually? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> 
Well, that's not going to help you <laughs> and on, in every sphere, is it, John? Because you, you, you don't work there anyway. You work in the words and ideas industry. Right. So what if someone said, you know, people named Gabriel are intellectually, uh, you know, uh, inferior and mm -hmm. should not have jobs like, you know, as journalists or, mm -hmm. or shouldn't be allowed to speak in public, right? Mm -hmm. Should be segregated from society in various ways, right? Right. Okay. Would you be offended by that? No. Or what would, be, what would your response be? I would laugh first. Uh-huh. And then I would think, that person's an idiot. Uh -huh. And then I'd probably write an article on why they're an idiot. Uh -huh. And uh, I would make funny Photoshops about it. I, right. I, I don't understand getting offended by that. If somebody's wrong, I expect other people to be wrong because they're not as brilliant as me, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, being offended by it, it's just like, well, their brain's broke. I don't, you know, I, I pity them for not understand the awesome that I'm bringing to the table, but I'm not offended. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I am, I'm trying to play, I'm trying to give them their due. I'm trying to be just to their, their argument here. Mm -hmm. So I think what their argument would be is, well, okay, so that would be one guy who wants to put all the Gabriels in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. What if there's five? What if there's mm -hmm. 10? What if there's 50? What if there's a thousand? And what if one, what if one of them is a congressperson? Mm -hmm. well, what if five of them are congresspeople? What if the president of the United States <laughs> doesn't like people named Gabriel. Well, he's, mm -hmm. he doesn't like other groups, you know. Mm -hmm. There could be some time where a president doesn't like people named Gabriel or doesn't <laughs> like middle-aged white guys with beards from Arizona yeah. or what, right? Finn's you know? living in Arizona. So I'm saying. Finnish like, extraction, yeah. So the argument is, yeah. Finn. I wouldn't be offended if 95% of the population wanted to outlaw Gabrielism and throw me in a concentration camp. I still wouldn't be offended by yeah. them. I would work to stop them. There you go. But I don't understand the emotional component mm -hmm. of taking offense and, oh, how dare you? I, I don't, well, I think I used to have that instinct when I was younger and now I don't. I'm writing this book because I don't even understand that instinct anymore hmm. of saying, how dare you and falling on a fainting couch. I don't get it because it doesn't accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. If I write an article against this anti-Gabriel legislation, okay, I'm doing something. If I go speak at a committee meeting against it, I'm doing something. Feeling something accomplishes nothing. And I, I think a lot of people um, in the online world and the world that we're in as well they take offense because they want to seem like they care about an issue, but they are unwilling to get off their sofas and sectionals and turn off Netflix and do something about it. It makes them feel better to say, I'm very concerned about police shooting too many black youths. Mm -hmm. Do something about it. I am too, and white youths, which they shoot a lot more of. I'm really upset about all those things, so I will do what I can to affect change in that. Being offended, being upset about it, accomplishes nothing. Oh, I'm raising awareness. Good for you. What does that help? We're all aware that there's police brutality out there. Do something about it. Right. So I, I think a, a lot of it, too, is just like this kind of social positioning and everybody's, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about signaling and virtue signaling and things like that. Uh, virtue signaling just doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't offend me. It doesn't accomplish anything. Virtue is very important. Virtue will actually accomplish things. And, um, you know, I'll get told because it's the new buzzword that I'm a virtue of signaling. I'm saying there's a difference between signaling, virtue signaling, and virtue. And for my personal virtue, I want to be one of these guys out there trying to affect change rather than bitching about it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know of, I mean, there may, be a, may have been one. I don't know of any black South Africans who lived under apartheid who were offended mm -hmm. by, right. white, by white racism. Uh -huh. They worked their asses off to get out of apartheid, to exactly. demolish a apartheid in various ways, but mm -hmm. I just don't... I they did not have the luxury of having a purely emotional reaction to a very dire yeah. situation. I mean, I, you know, I can't... I mean, I'm thinking... They Nelson, took action. They didn't Nelson, the, emote. Bo both Mandela's, Steve Biko, I mean, all the intellect. I can't think of them ever saying, gee, I wish the white people would, you know, talk about us better. <laughs> right, right. They were organizing for a revolution. Right, right. right. The Vietnamese, you know, as we were mm -hmm. dropping all those bombs on them and killing possibly two million of them in the jungles. I don't recall Ho Chi Minh saying, would you please stop calling us gooks? Because it hurts How our feelings. How dare you? Right? And then I've been reading, do you know Victor Klemperer? He wrote this amazing memoir. No. He's a Jew in no. Berlin mm -hmm. in the 1930s. Amazing memoir. And he's, you know, it's about, he's living, he ends up, of course, they shove all the Jews in the cities into, into Jew houses, they were called. They were mm -hmm. just like... They weren't in concentration camps. They were just only allowed to live in certain places so the Jews get concentrated. So they were like, all these Jews would be living in these buildings or apartments right. together, and they hang out, and Victor Klemper sort of just 
talking about what the Jews in Berlin in the 1930s are saying. Uh -huh. And it was just about like, A, is there going to be a war? B, when's it going to happen? C, when do we get lined up and shot? D, how do we get the fuck out of here, <laughs> right? Yeah. And E, oh, we can't get the fuck out of here because the United States won't let us in, nor Great uh -huh. Britain. But basically, it was simply practical responses to mm -hmm. Nazism and anti-Semitism. Not, right. you're hurting our feelings. Please, not Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. stop calling us vermin. Have you no shame <laughs> at long last? You're totally right. I've always said this to my college students. I was like, you guys think you, str you think like... You struggle, and this is hard, and, and like tell that to the Vietnamese right, and the Cambodians right. and the Black South Africans uh -huh. in the 1980s. Yeah. You know? God damn it! It's simply <laughs> the consequence of being rich, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of everybody's talking about late stage capitalism now. It is very, it is very much um, the option of privilege mm -hmm. to uh, lounge about and uh, form a list of things that offend you. Um, I expect in life to be, you know, people to be jerks, violent, hateful to me my entire life. Um, and again, just being offended by it, I will avoid those people. Well, that's I, I don't have any interest. Don't worry about in... that. That's just standard anti-Gabrielism. It's no <laughs> right, big deal. Right, I mean, it's exactly. not a real force in the society. It's because I'm Finnish. It's growing, though. There's an anti-Swomite uh, contingency I, out here who I wants I to hold my people down. I saw some graffiti on the wall coming over here. I, just didn't, I didn't want to tell you about it <laughs> to alarm you, but it just did say something about you. But um yeah, that's awesome. So outrage. So, and here's the great thing about it: the just disgusting, hideous irony of it is that what they're doing is, of course, granting importance to us. They're saying Correct. that we are important mm -hmm. to them. Right. Right. We are important to them. They want us to be in a, a particular kind of person because I guess they want to be around us. They want us to stick mm -hmm. around. You know, as far as I know, like a lot of the people in the ANC, you know, and the Viet Cong uh, weren't so interested in keeping their oppressors around. Right. They weren't so concerned about what or their oppressors them. thought of them. Yeah, they knew yeah. exactly what their oppressors thought of them. Uh -huh. They just wanted to get rid of their oppressors. Right, right. So let's get busy, people, and do that. <laughs> if you have oppressors, I'll join with you. Uh -huh. But what you're saying is you want that oppressor. Mm -hmm. You want that oppressor to be your dad, yeah. and you want that you want oppressor, him to buy you a sofa. You want him to and you pay want a him to be college, and you want him to be the Barack Obama version of your dad, not the Donald Trump version of your dad, because mm -hmm. a Barack Obama doesn't embarrass you in front of your friends. I'm serious, right? right? I mean, that's oh, what yeah. it comes yeah. down to. Exactly. It's like this Freudian thing. Mm -hmm. These these people who demand that we think a particular way and act a particular way, I think, mm -hmm. are seeking a good father. Yeah. Oh. And I, and I think uh, you, you, you and I are the very few weirdos out here, your listeners, who say, that ain't my daddy. You know, <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> right. I got a dad. I know who he yeah. is. I oh, know no, my listeners. Is. Just like I have no interest in uh, a father figure. I don't need that. My listeners have heard this uh, versions of this before. They know this. Yeah. Well, I am their dad, though. They know that, right? Oh, that's Everyone good. listening, that's know, you know I'm your dad, right? <laughs> that's why you listen. I uh, was not in town nine months ago. I am not your dad. <laughs> So what's next for you? What are you up to? What are you thinking of? Are you going to move to Oregon with me? Yeah, I'll be after I think the you show. I'll be, I'll be moving. Uh, we were talking earlier, too. It was just about, yeah, my first trip to Oregon over the summer. Gorgeous. Loved it. Um, my kids are uh, looking at college now, so uh, I'll be pushing them out of the house and uh, bringing some uh, university brochures from uh, all, all across Pacific Northwest to my, to my eldest. And uh, now, I, now I have a motivation to get her into one of those schools. Yeah. We, she a, could uh, fix Evergreen State, maybe up near. Uh, uh, no, Olympia. no one can. <laughs> no, that just has to be nuked. There's right. no. I'm sorry. It's my only. Uh, that's my only pro-war position. <laughs> um, yeah, no sales tax in Oregon. You like uh -huh. that? You know, yeah. we've got this beautiful coastline that you took pictures of and showed right. me. You know? Right. And uh, and I need to be there near the ocean again. Well, most importantly, I'm there. So you, that's <laughs> that's why you need to move. I'm sure your wife and I will get along fine. Um, but. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, and it's been a tremendous pleasure following your work and your ideas and your spirit, really, above all else, mm -hmm. uh, in public and in private here. I, I really, really wish there were more people doing what we do who, who are like you. All right. And I really appreciate just what you're doing and keep doing it. Well, I appreciate what you're doing and just coming up with ideas other people aren't either are afraid to mention or they have never even considered before. Huh. I think the latter is usually the case. Yeah, indeed, 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 yeah. So uh, let's go get some lunch. Done. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered Community, 
go to unregisteredunderground.com. To get information and to buy tickets to the Renegade University weekend events in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. Thanks for listening.